In this lecture, what we're going to do is called reparametrization of a curve with respect to arc length. It's a neat algorithm. We'll go through the steps and we'll talk about why you would want to do it and why you wouldn't want to do it. But before we do that, let's just recap a lot of the notation that we've seen so far. So some of these items will be used in this lecture, some in future lectures. I think we're building up a lot of notation and a lot of different objects that we work with. So let's just pause and go through them. First off, we have these vector valued functions r of t, where typically we have t going from say zero to four or something like that. So t is going from some value a to some other value b. And what these vector valued functions are doing is parametrizing curves, typically space curves in R3, although we can also do this in R2. Viewed as vector valued functions, they are sweeping out the shapes of these curves. We're assuming that we're working with nice smooth parametrizations, which means that R of t is twice differentiable. So we have a nice derivative that we can take, and also that derivative is nice and continuous, and also the velocity vector r prime is never zero. In other words, we have nice descriptions of these curves. So r prime of t is our velocity vector. r double prime is our acceleration vector. I didn't put it up here. Given our parametrization r of t, the unit tangent vector that we can compute along the curve, we denote by t hat. And it's the velocity vector divided by the speed. So we take the velocity vector and we make it unit length to create this unit tangent vector. Then we saw that the arc length for the entire curve, so if I want to take this parametrization from A to B and, and compute the total length of the curve that it sweeps out in space, that's the integral from A to B of the speed dt. So the integral from A to B of the length of r prime dt. But maybe we don't want to compute the entire length from A to B, we would like to be able to be flexible. To do that, we created the arc length function, little less of t, which integrates the speed from a to t. So it's a function of t, allowing us to choose where we cut off our arc length measurement. So that's why I've, I switched to u here for this integral. Note that compared with the line above, l, if we think of that as the arc length for the entire curve, that's s of b. I put it at the bottom here, although it was one of the first notions that we defined, and that's because I want to emphasize that the speed of the parametrization is the derivative of the arc length function. So if you see s prime, you need to think speed. s is the arc length function, s prime is speed. It's a little bit confusing because s sounds like speed, but it has to be s prime if we're talking about the speed. So of course that's the length of the velocity vector. Okay, let's move on to the topic for this lecture, which is reparametrization of a curve with respect to arc length. So we're going to imagine that we already have a parametrization, and then we're going to reparametrize. Here's the question that we can think about. Does arc length depend on parametrization? The answer is no because arc length is intrinsic to the curve. And that should make sense to you because if I hand you a piece of string and say, how long is this? You wouldn't answer, well, it depends how I parametrize the string. Length is just a geometric notion. If we have a curve in space, it has a length, whether we have a parametrization for it or not. And if you and your roommate take the same curve, but you parametrize it two different ways, you will actually compute the same arc length because it's the same curve. It has the same shape, the same size. All right, now we're going to begin reparametrizing a basic curve with respect to arc length. This is an algorithm that has several steps, so I've tried to divide it up into concrete actions. So the first thing we're going to do is find the arc length function for this helix, r of t equals cosine of t, sine of t, t, for t values going from 0 to 10. So this is our nice basic helix, where x and y are spinning around and z is traveling up. So the central axis for this helix is the z-axis. 
If we're asked to find the arc length function, what are we looking for? We're looking for s of t. OK, to get that, the first thing we need to do is compute the velocity vector. So r prime of t is term by term differentiation. That's going to be negative sine of t cosine of t 1. The next thing we need to do is find the speed. So let's compute the magnitude of this vector. So that's going to be the square root of negative sine of t squared plus cosine squared plus 1. Sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, so overall this is the square root of 2. Now to find the arc length function, I'm going to integrate the speed from 0 to t. It has to be a function of t. The arc length function is the integral from 0 to t of the speed, which was actually a nice constant square root of 2, du. So then we anti-differentiate. We get square root of 2 u evaluated from 0 to t. So overall, that's going to be the square root of 2 t. In the description, s of t equals the square root of 2 t, this is a function of t. So we can think of t as the independent variable, s as the dependent variable. So given a value of t, we plug it in, we get s. The next question is, can I invert the roles? Can I invert this function and say that t is a function of s? And the answer is yes. If s equals the square root of 2 t, then t equals s divided by the square root of 2. Now we've done the first two steps of reparameterization with respect to arc length. So the first thing we did was we computed the arc length function s, and then we inverted to find t in terms of s. Not every function is invertible. So next I want to discuss whether or not step two is always possible if we're planning to reparameterize a smooth curve with respect to arc length. So let's take a second to discuss whether this is always possible for other smooth parameterizations. And by this, I mean step number two. The answer is yes. And here's some justification for that response. So I just want to sketch a picture. In step number one, we found s as a function of t. So I can imagine t as being the independent variable and s as being the dependent variable. Suppose our parameterization starts at a. What is s of a? Well, s of a actually has to be 0. right? If we go back in here and plug in a for the top bound, we would be integrating from a to a. Algebraically, that's 0, but also geometrically, it should be 0 because that means that we're not traveling down the curve. We're staying right at the starting point, so we don't get any length out of that. OK, so if I started to try to graph this function right at t equals a, s would be 0. My next question is, as I travel in the direction of increasing t, what must happen to s? We could approach this algebraically, but actually just think about what happens along the curve as you travel down the curve. If I'm an ant on the curve and I start walking along the curve, am I racking up positive distance? In other words, as you travel down the curve, what happens to the length of the curve that you're measuring? And of course, it must go up. So if I travel around this helix, the farther I go, the longer my path. It's only natural to expect that as we travel along the curve, we're traversing more and more length. Intuitively, that's the reason why we can say that s is a strictly increasing function, but there's also a calculus reason, and that is that s prime is the speed of the curve, which for a smooth curve is always positive. It's the magnitude of a vector, so it's positive or zero. But for a smooth parameterization, we're assuming it's never zero. So both of these together communicate the same message, which is that s is strictly increasing with respect to t. And this is good news, because if you're strictly increasing, then you pass the horizontal line test. That means you're invertible. Therefore, the answer to this question is yes.
if we have a smooth parameterization, then theoretically we can always invert the function s of t to solve for t in terms of s. I say theoretically because maybe it's a, it's a hard inversion to do, but we can always say that if s is a function of t, t is also a function of s. All right, let's move on to the third step in this process. It's a three-step process. So we found the arc length function, we inverted it to solve for t in terms of s, and the last step is to reparametrize our original parameterization, replacing t with its expression for s. So what I mean by that is let's have r sub 1 of s be r of t of s, and that's going to be cosine of s over the square root of 2. So I'm going to go to my original parameterization, and everywhere I have t, I'm going to plug in s over the square root of 2. So cosine s over the square root of 2, sine s over the square root of 2, s over the square root of 2. We found the components for the reparameterization, but we also have to adjust the time. Our original time range was from 0 to 10, but that was for t. If s is square root of 2t, then that means that when t is 0, s is 0, and when t is 10, s is 10 square root of 2. So we've adjusted the components, and we also had to adjust the time interval so that we trace out exactly the same curve. So ultimately, what we've done is reparametrize with respect to the arc length parameter s. Now, why do we do this? What have we achieved? At first glance, maybe nothing because we're just tracing out the same curve. So why do we ever reparametrize? And we reparametrized if we get some advantage out of a different description. To see why we reparametrize with respect to arc length, let's compute the velocity and the speed for this reparametrization. So r1 prime, so differentiate with respect to s, and we get 1 over the square root of 2 times negative sine s over the square root of 2, 1 over the square root of 2 cosine s over the square root of 2, 1 over the square root of 2. Okay, so that's our velocity vector. Now let's compute the speed. So we take the magnitude of that vector, and we get the square root of 1 half sine squared of s over the square root of 2 plus 1 half cosine squared of s over the square root of 2 plus 1 half. 1 half sine squared plus 1 half cosine squared is 1 half, so we have the square root of 1 half plus 1 half, which of course is the square root of 1, which is 1. So the reason why we reparametrize with respect to arc length is that the resulting parameterization after doing this is unit speed. In other words, r1 prime is actually t hat. So that's the advantage. We take our parameterization, which might have varying speed, perhaps sometimes the velocity vectors are very long, sometimes they're short. We could be traveling around this curve, moving differently in different places, and we make it uniform so that our parameterization sweeps out this curve at a constant unit speed rate. That's why anyone would ever do this. Why is it not so great? Well, for this particular example of the helix, it was a pretty okay calculation, but sometimes it's very computationally difficult. Take this as a warning. When you're doing these problems, if you're doing some reparameterizations with respect to arc length, follow these three steps. First, compute the arc length function, then invert to solve for t in terms of s, then plug that into the original parameterization. However, it's quite possible that an example that you'll be working on will be much more tedious than the example that I've done in this lecture. So I chose the helix because it lends itself very gracefully to this calculation. But for a different curve, there might not be any way to do it except to have a very messy calculation. I hope you don't encounter anything that's too computationally difficult and you, you lose your love of reparameterization with respect to arc length. Okay, thank you for your attention.